And that is one of the first marks that we're going to be talking about is our birthmark. And what are the qualifications or what do we see in our life? When we became a Christian, God gave to us marks. He gave to us qualifications in our life that when people would see us, they would see that we are representations of Him. You know, birthmarks, uh, a, a lot of kids, probably six out of every ten children that are born, have some type of a birthmark. Whether it's a physical birthmark that you can see, or maybe it's a birthmark that you hide, a lot of us have birthmarks, places in our body that we would have when we were first born. And we're going to take that birthmark that God has given to us at birth, physically, and tie that into a birthmark that God has given to us spiritually, that we have marks of a Christian. This week, we're talking about the birthmark. Next week, we're going to be talking about hallmark, the love that we have within our life. And then we're going to be talking about a watermark, time in our life that we've given our life to Christ, and we have sealed that through, through the salvation that we have with Christ and been baptized in the water for our watermark. And then we're going to be talking about a landmark, things that we can set in our past and say, this is exactly why I know that I'm a child of God because I have set in stone some things within my life. And I can go to that point and know that I have a landmark within my life, a point within my life that I hold on to that know that Christ took care of me, a landmark. But a birthmark, we're taking 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Let me give you a little background. John is the author. John lives in Ephesus at the time, and John has outlived all the other apostles. He is, he is up in age, and he's wanting to write to the church. He's wanting to write to the Christians and say, I want to give you hope. I want to let you know that you are overcomers. You have won if you have your faith in Christ. You do not have to worry about all the mundane things of God. If you are a child of God, I want to let you know that Jesus Christ has done things for you and through you that you can't comprehend. All the way through his life, he was talking about people that have lived a mundane life and tried to do the right thing but kept on failing. And now in 1 John chapter 5, he wants to say, you have been overcomers. You have victory within your life. You do not have to live a life of defeat. You have conquered the world. You have overcome. And sometimes I believe the church today, we need to know that our faith is in Jesus Christ. And if we have our faith in Christ, we have overcome this world. How do we know that? Let me read some verses for you and follow along if you would. And uh, whether it's in the King James or New King James or New Living Translation, that I'm going to read out the New Living Translation. I think your bulletin is in the New King James Version. But it says this in the New Living Translation. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is a child of God. And anyone who loves the Father loves his children too. We know we love God's children if we love God and obey his commandments. Loving God means keeping his commandments. And really, that, is, that isn't difficult. For every child of God defeats this evil world by trusting God's love and through victory. And the ones who wins is the battle against the world are the ones who believe that Jesus is the Son of God. That Jesus is the Son of God. Now let's drop down to verses 12 and 13. It says, So whoever has, God's, whoever has God's Son has life. Whoever does not have His Son does not have life. I write this to you who believe in the Son of God so that you may know you have eternal life. I write this. John is writing this. John is up in years and he's saying, I want you to know. Not I want you to think. Not I want you to hope. Not I hope that when you die, your good will outweigh your bad so you get to go to heaven. Not that you do good works. Not that you trust in your family or you trust in the church. I want you to know without a shadow of a doubt that you can have faith and confidence in Jesus Christ because you have faith in Jesus. The only way. And John was communicating, you can have victory. You don't have to live in mundane. You don't have to live a defeated life. You can have Christianity and have that as a vibrant part within your life and you can live a victorious life. How do you know that? Well, I believe there's a few things that we can know about our, our watermark and our faith mark and our birthmark. The first, let's go back to some scriptures. And 
the first thing that we want to find out right now is, do you have a birthmark? Do you have a spiritual birthmark? Because I believe that we can't talk about those birthmarks until we first understand, do I have a spiritual birthmark? Let me put it in Christian terms. Have you been redeemed? Have you been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ? Are you a child of God? You don't have to worry about things. You don't have to worry about what's going to take place tomorrow. You can know and know for sure that Jesus Christ is your Lord and your Savior. And I want to go through some scriptures with you to understand that you have to have a birthmark. You have to have a spiritual time within your life that you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And they're not difficult because it's nothing that you do. It's not going to church. It's not giving money. It's not being something. It is having faith in Jesus. Very simple. It's him doing his work. We accepting it by faith that he is who he says he is. First of all, let's look at Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, if you have your Bibles, verses 9 through 11. It says that if thou shalt confess with the mouth the Lord Jesus, and have believed in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. I am going to have my faith in Christ. It is nothing that I have done. It's what Christ has done through me. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, it says this, For by grace are ye saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's not about anything that you do. Our salvation is only in Jesus Christ. It is firmly planted in the work of Jesus, not in our work. Not of works, lest any man or any woman should boast. So our first thing that we have to understand, if that is true, if my faith is in Jesus and what Jesus Christ has done for me, and I've accepted him as my Lord and Savior, what transformation, what things have changed within my life? Why am I different now than what I was before I gave my life to Christ? What is it that changed? What is it that, that has radically took my life and just because of my faith in him and my forgiveness of what Jesus Christ has done for me and my sins are under the blood of the Lord, what, what changes does it do within my life? And I think that we've been bought and blinded by some misconceptions of our society today that, that the world calls the world. The, the, the procedures, the man-made procedures of our society, our culture, has deluded down the idea of spirituality and has misrepresented truth to say the church can do this. Or as long as you're a good person, you can go to heaven. It is nothing about you, and it's nothing about being a good person. We've heard it all different misrepresentations of the truth, and it's all boiled down. If the Bible is true, then it's all about Jesus. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. And the Bible says we should boast nothing about ourselves, and we should only boast about the things of Christ, about what Christ has done for us. So what would be some marks? What would be some trademarks? What would be some birthmarks within your life that if somebody would look at you, they would say that mark within your life, and they would say, you're a child of God because, not because of things that you do, but because of who you are. What are some things within your life that should be so evident, be so real, that when they look at you, they first know he has been with Christ? They looked at the disciples, all the people around. They said, they said these guys are ignorant and unlearned men, but they could tell they've been with Jesus. What a compliment. We don't have to have all the knowledge of the world. We don't have to be the most intellectual person of the world. What we have to have is we have to have the opportunity to be with Jesus. Because when Jesus comes into our life and we have accepted him as our Lord and Savior, he radically changes things within our life. It's not of us, it's about him. And the first thing that is a mark, I believe, in 1 John chapter 5, verse 1, it's about the love of God. We have 
within our life a desire to love God. We have a desire to thank God. We have a desire to worship God. We have a desire to be with God. We have a desire to do the things that he wants us to do. And in verse 1 it says, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him, begot that loveth him, also loveth the church. By this we know that we love the children of God. First of all, we have to have a passion and a love for God. And if we have a passion and love for God, we also will have a passionate love for his children. Not only the love for God, but a love for the thing that God loves. And God loves his church. God loves his children. And if you love a passion for God, you will have a passion and love for his people. It will automatically take place. It will take place in a way that we do not understand, but God does great things through us. In that same book, 1 John chapter 4, listen to these. Verses 4, uh, verses, chapter 4, verses 7 through 12. Dear friends, let us continue to love one another. For love comes from God. Anyone who loves is born of God and knows God. But anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. God showed how much he loved us by sending his son into this world so that we might do eternal life through him. This is real love. It's not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to sacrifice to take away our sins. Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. No one has ever seen God. But if we love each other, God lives in us. And his love has been brought to full expression through us. Our first mark should be that we love God. And if we love God, and we have accepted God's forgiveness, we've accepted his salvation through faith, then what we can do is we can love God. And that, that allows us, because it's not about what we think of ourselves. It's not about what you think of me. It's we are the ambassadors or representatives of God to you. And if we love God, what our job will be is to love others. It's a mark within our life. It should be so real and so genuine because God has forgiven us. It is so openly available for us to radiate his love towards others. Even though you may not be lovely. Even though we may have problems, we can have the true underlying fact that my life is about God and God's name is love. And if God is love, he uses me to be his corridor, his ambassador, his communication, his herald, his proclaimer. I need to be able to love people. So our first mark when people look at you, do they see that you have a love for God? And do they see that you have a love for others? Because 1 John is full of understanding that you have to have a passion for love. The second thing is a love for the book. A love for the book or obedience to him. In uh, verses 2 and 3, By this we know that we have love for the children of God when we love God, and what's the next phrase? And keep his commandments. Understand his book. Understand what he wants us to do. And I like what verse 3 it says. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. In other words, oh, I got to do the church thing. I got to do what the Bible says. And if the Bible becomes so grievous to us, if we're reading the Bible and say, I don't care what the Bible says. I want to do my own thing. Then the Bible becomes grievous. But if we have a love for God, and a love for his people, and a love for his book, what we would say is, what does the Bible say? What does God want me to do? Because what I want is I want God's blessing upon my life. I want to love God. I want to love others. And I want to open up his book. And I want to know what the word of God says. Why? It's because I love God. And the word of God is not a cosmic killjoy that's going to keep us from doing what he wants us to do. What it is, it's a conduit of blessing within our life. And if we understand God's word is for a purpose, it is for us to be able to understand God's heart. And if we can understand God's heart, what we do is follow after his will. What we are in is his way. We're in his worship. We're in his blessing. 
We have to have a passion for God's Word. We have to understand God's Word. So if our birthmark is, number one, that nobody sees that you have a passion and love for God, and we don't have a love for others, and we never open up His Word, we never communicate God's Word, we never read His Word, we could care less what the Bible says, even though we even say, you know what, I don't care what the Bible says, this is what I want to do. I would say, first of all, we haven't seen the birthmark of our spiritual life in Christ. Because if we have a love for God, a love for others, and a love and a passion to understand what God wants for our lives, and it's not grievous, it's not burdensome. You know, when the disciples were talking, the Pharisees came around, the, the Bible says the Pharisees made religion a, a burden because it was so hard to keep man-made laws. You have to do this, you have to do this, you have to keep this, you have to keep this. So people started being fearful of spirituality because man-made laws are hard for us to accomplish because it's all about the opinions of a man. And the Word of God is not the opinion of man. The Word of God is God's Word. And here's the greatest thing about it. God's Word, through the power of the Holy Spirit, has given us power to live in His Word. To understand that He cannot tell us to do something that he will not give us victory over. And the next part is so awesome because God's word, love God's word. But then he does this for us. We can have victory from God. Here's, we can have a birthmark having victory in God. Verse 4 and 5, listen to this. For whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. Stop right there. Has overcome. It's a word that means winner. I have overcome the world. Now, who is our faith in? Me? Am I saved because of what I've done? I am saved through Jesus. And because of Jesus, because him dying on the cross for my sins, because my faith in him, I have the ability to overcome the world. Not me. Because in me, there's nothing good. But because of Jesus... I can be put into his victory plan because I have confidence in Christ. I have overcome the world. Does it mean I'm not going to sin? Does it mean that I'm not going to make mistakes? What it does mean is that Jesus loves me and he wants me to follow after him. If I have a passion for God, a passion for people, and love God's word, I understand that I'm going to fail. I understand I'm going to make mistakes. But I also understand that my righteousness is in Jesus Christ. I have to understand that my victory is in Jesus Christ. I have to understand that whatever I do on a daily basis, if I put my life into Christ's hands, I can have victory over the world. What is that? That means Satan and the philosophy of this world that is so anti-God, anti-word, that they are trying to discredit anything that God says or anything that the Word of God wants, the world philosophy tries to discredit. Satan has blinded the eyes of our culture. Why is that? It's because when Satan was cast out of heaven, he was cast on this earth, and he is the prince and the power of this earth. He is victory over this earth. We are aliens of this earth. We should be different because we are not this world. One of these days, if we are a child of God, we will be escorted out of this world and into heaven. Why is that? Because Jesus died on the cross for our sins. He was buried, and he had the power of death, resurrection, and victory. I have victory in my sins. I have victory over my sins, not because of me. Because if it's about me, I would fail today. I would say, I can't do this. But I know that I trust in the living God that sent his son to die on the cross for my sins. And I can have victory over sin because of Jesus. When I pray, I don't pray in the name of Bruce Thomas. It doesn't get anywhere. When I pray, thank you, in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Why? is because at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That is our victory. That is our power. That is our authority. 
And let's go on to the next. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. We can have victory over God. We can have victory over this world because of our faith in God. Jesus has overcome the world. He has defeated Satan. He has defeated the philosophy of this world. Our birthmark, are you of the world or are you of Christ? Where will you stand? In the midst of danger, in the midst of your fear, in the midst of your chaos, in the midst of your insecurities, in the midst of your sin, in the midst of confrontation, where will you stand? Will you stand on the side of God or will you stand on the side of this world's philosophy? Will you say, I don't care what God wants, I don't care what God thinks, I don't care if he's upset at me. I don't care what the Bible says. Or will you say, you know what? I'm wrong. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 9 is to the church, is to the believers. I know that we're saved by faith, the moment that we give our life to Christ. I know that my sin is under the blood of Jesus Christ. Past, present, and future sins are under the blood of Jesus. But 1 John 1, 9 tells me that my relationship with God is hurt when I harbor sin within my life and I say I don't want to give my sin to God. I want to keep my sin to myself. Now, sin is not your opinion. Sin is God's word. If God's word states it is wrong, it's wrong. If Al doesn't like what you do, it's opinion. Al's opinion doesn't matter. God's word matters. Do we understand that? God's word. We do not have to live up to everyone's opinion. If we love God, our mark within our life will say, I am not pleasing man. I'm pleasing God. And if we please God, what do we do? We love man. But if I try to please man, I can't love God. So in order for me to do what God wants me to be, I first have to love God with my whole heart. And if I love God, the evidence of me loving God will be me loving others. And if I love God and I love others, the thing that God has given to me to understand the will of my life is the Word of God. It gets me out of legalism. It gets me out of people's opinions. What it does, it puts me firmly in what does God want for my life. And if I get to the place that I want what God wants, and I have a passion for God, it doesn't mean that I'm going to be perfect. It doesn't mean that I'm going to live up to everything. But what it does mean is I know what God wants, and God will give me the power and the authority to follow after his word. That is so liberating. Why is that liberating? Because I know that the one that loves me, the one that died for me, the one that forgives me of all my sins, he wants a relationship with me. As much as I need him, he wants me. Have you ever been wanted that much? Have you ever been destitute to a point where you feel like there's no hope, there's no passion for the future, and God supernaturally comes within your life and builds a relationship with you or gives to you the very desires of your heart, and all of a sudden that, that loneliness and that depression, that, that sadness that you have within your life, this is vanquished away because God supernaturally came within your life and gave to you, maybe it's a relationship on this earth or it may just be the relationship that God has given to you. But you put your faith and your confidence in him. He is the only person that can meet your deepest need. The deepest soul-searching need within your life is to know that there's a purpose and that God is loves you. When you pray in the mornings and you pray at night and you open the word of God, you know that God is real. And you know once we've been a Christian for some time and the marks of our faith are evident, 
the fears that we once had, we understand that Christ can take care of them. We see God working in miraculous ways. And then we read a book called 1 John, and we see how God works within our life. I know I'm a child of God. Not that I hope I'm a child of God. I know. Why do I know? Because when Jesus Christ saved me, he allowed me a transformation within my life from one family to another. Now, I wish my transformation took place instantaneously. I wish the moment I gave my life to Christ, I was exalted into a perfect holy state and I never sinned again. I really wish that took place. But I can promise you, over the last 35 years, I have sinned a few times since my salvation experience. But you know what? God loves me anyway. God loves me anyway. God loves me for who I am because of what Jesus Christ did for me. And he loves me because God brought to me his son. And he said, this is the fact. Let me tell you what the word of God says. This is truth. Jesus loves you. And he died on the cross for your sins. And if you accept me, you can go to heaven. But here's the negative side of that. If you don't accept me, you are not, in the Christian word, saved. Either you are or you're not. And it's all about the common denominator of Jesus. It is in Christ or through Christ. Let me give you a, a verse that, that when anybody would come up to me and, and talk to me, whether a different religion, a different denomination, and they say that Jesus is not the Son of God, and all you have to do is do good works, all you have to do is do certain things. This verse, you ought to put this in the flyleaf of your Bible, because I'm going to give you a verse that brings the gospel down. You think John 3.16 is good, and that's phenomenal? John 3.36 is amazing, because John 3.36, it makes it black or white. Here it is. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe on the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Wow. Either you do or you don't. Either you want the blessings of God or you want the wrath of God. What's the common denominator? Jesus. Either you come to the point that you have faith in Christ, you're saved. You come to the point that you reject Jesus Christ, you're not saved. Salvation is not about any good works. Salvation is all based on Jesus. And when we accept Jesus as my Lord and my Savior, I'm a child of God. I'm a joint heir to the King. I have all, all those things that are in your insert of your Bible, that's who you are, and that's what you have. And Jesus has given to you all those things, not only for eternity, but now. You've already been gained access to heaven. You've already been forgiven. You have all those things within your life. You're saved from all of the utter destruction. And when you're saved, you gain all of God's blessing. It's either you have the worship and the blessing of God, or you will be in the wrath of God. Not only today, but also the day that you die. The wrath of God is basically this. Eternity from the very existence of good, of light, of peace, of calmness. You think right now that you go through depression? You think you have major issues going now? For all eternity, in a place called hell, that you will have all the passions, all the desires, all the thoughts that you've ever had upon this earth. You're going to remember a day that you came to church and you heard this preacher proclaim the message of Jesus in 1 John chapter 1, verses 5, and you're going to remember that for the rest of eternity because you said no. And you'll never be able to get that off your mind because right now, it's Jesus. And the birthmark is this. 
Do you have a love for God? Do you have a love for people? Do you have a passion for the Word of God? Do you have faith in Christ? Because if you have all those things, you have victory. You have victory over sin, over the deception of Satan, over the lies that Satan has brought into your life. How do you understand the deception of Satan's lies? Is because you have a passion for the truth, the Word of God. You have love for God. I have a passion for God, yeah. How do you transfer the passion for God into understanding the truth is to know what the Word of God says. Because the Word of God is truth, absolute truth. Satan is called what? A liar and the father of it. Satan does not the truth because he does not know the truth. Jesus is the truth. So if we love God, what we want is we want the truth to get in us so we have to know the Word of God so we can see the deception of Satan. And once we see the deception of Satan, we can understand, I trust in God. And if I see the deception of Satan, but I trust in God, I know I'm child of God because I'm not listening to the deceptions of this world. I see the truth. I understand the truth. I have victory over Satan, over this world philosophy. Why is that? Because I know that I have a passion for God and know the truth and know that because I'm a child of God, I have victory over this world. That's how I know that I'm a child of God. Not because I feel like it. Not because I wake up seven days a week, 52 weeks out of the year and feel wonderful. Not that I want to be a pastor 24-7. Not that I just love people all the time. That doesn't make me saved. You know what makes me saved? Jesus. My faith in Christ. Not what I do, but my faith in Him and Him alone gains access to heaven. All the other things are symptoms, are byproducts of my faith in Christ. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. Period. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. What does that mean? That there's a time within your life that you said, I'm a sinner. There's a time in your life that you said, I can't do this on my own. There's a time in your life where you fell on your face before God and said, I need Jesus. Because if I do not have Jesus, I don't have life. And I need Jesus to forgive me of my sin. And if I ask Jesus to forgive me of my sin, I know, I know that I'll be forgiven. And forgiveness is everything. Not just bad things, but everything that I've ever done is under the blood of Jesus Christ. Because I am His child. And God looks at me through his son. I don't gain access because of Bruce Thomas. I gain access to heaven because of Jesus. There's no other way that I can get to heaven except by Jesus. And if we understand that, then I say, when I ask a simple question, have you given your life to Jesus? Have you been saved? You understand it's not about doing good. It's not about even praying a prayer. It's about your faith in Christ and understanding that if you truly are a child of God, you understand that you have a love for God. You have a love for His children. You have a passion for the Word of God. You understand that the truth is what makes us free. You understand Satan is a liar and a deceiver. And he has polluted the world's philosophy and diluted the truth so much that the world doesn't understand God. They even looked at God. They looked at Jesus and they laughed and mocked him. They're going to laugh and mock you. Why? It's because you represent. You understand that you are an alien. You're different. You know, the word Christian in, in, the, in, in the city of Antioch, they were first called Christians in the city of Antioch. That was not a popular term. And that was not a positive term. They were making fun of them. Oh, you're that little Christ-like one. You think that Jesus is going to be your salvation? Let me tell you, that is not the truth, is what they were trying to say. So when they called the Christians in Antioch Christians, 
It wasn't an elevated term of awesomeness. It was a derogatory term. Even back in the days of Jesus, it was not popular to be a Christian. And I tell you today, in this world's philosophy, it's not popular to be a Christian. Why? It's because you're under his authority. You're under authority. You're not the authority. You're not going to heaven because of you. You can't be good enough to go to heaven. You can't give enough to go to heaven. You can't know enough to go to heaven. You know what you can do to go to heaven? Have faith in Jesus. If you have faith in Jesus, accept him as your Lord, ask him to forgive you of your sins, guess what? You're adopted into a new family. Everything that has ever been promised to you is yours. It's either you have heaven or you have an existence of eternity absent from God. I choose heaven. I chose heaven when I was 19 years of age. And I've never regretted that decision. It has been the decision that has changed and marked my life. And I thank God for expressing to me true forgiveness, adopting me into a brand new family, and giving to me the blessings of God for my entire life. I cannot and I will never not be eternally thankful and grateful for what he has done for me. But can I ask you that same question? Are you eternally grateful for your salvation? When you look at your spiritual marks within your life, can I say, is there a mark within your life? Is there a time within your life that you can say, I may not know the moment, the day, or the hour, but I know that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins. And I know that I accepted him as my Lord. And I know without a doubt that if I die, I go to heaven. I promise you, if you do not have that eternal security, if you do not have that knowledge of the truth, you are living in fear of tomorrow. Because tomorrow, we have no hope. We know today, but tomorrow, there's no hope in tomorrow. Our hope is in Jesus. So I'm going to ask you to do something. I don't do this very often, but I think this is a very important time to do. I'm going to ask everyone to bow their heads. And I would like for me to be your pastor for a few minutes. I want you to evaluate your spiritual life. We're not talking about, are you happy spiritually? We're not talking about if you have sin within your life. We're not talking about if you have negativity, you have bitterness, or you have problems within your life. But I'm talking about, have you been born again? Have you been, in the Christian term, saved? If you haven't, if you're fearful of tomorrow, if you're saying, Bruce, I don't know if I have that birthmark within my life, will you just raise your hand and let me pray for you? If you have not done that, just raise your hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Because I want to have a word of prayer with you. And I want to have a word of prayer for you. And in your heart, if you would say this prayer, because God looks not at the outward appearance of man, but God looks deep within the heart of the individual. Let me say a prayer for you and just utter this prayer to God. Dear Father, forgive me of my sins. Lord, I know that I need you. I know that I can't go to heaven without you. I know without a shadow of a doubt that you died on the cross for my sins. And Lord, because of the fact that you are God's son, I give you my life. And I want you to come into my life. Renew my spirit. Allow me to be firmly planted in your family. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Well, the mark of a Christian. The first mark is the birthmark. And if you get the birthmark right, then we can have other marks that are evident within the life of a Christian. Next week is Hallmark. Now, it's kind of hard to come up with Hallmark. Next week is Valentine's week, okay? So I had to come up with what can I use as a mark for a Valentine's Day. So it's kind of a stretch. So Hallmark cards and the definition, I know it's a stretch. It, it wasn't me that came up with it. I'm just preaching. So, so Hallmark cards 
It's all about love. It's all about love. Listen to the story, and I think about it this week before you come to church next week. The Philippian jailer. Paul was in jail. Paul was beaten by this man. Handcuffed either to the soldier or to the chains or to the bars. And this man was beating him, ridiculing him, hating him. Something happened. And we're going to talk about it next week that changed this man's life. After a moment in time, what must I do to be saved? Paul communicated the truth. The man gave his life. He went from the prison guard to a father that changed his family's life because of an encounter with Jesus. He went from a prison guard that hated him to a man that served him dinner, brought his family to him, allowed him to see Jesus, baptized his family. There was something that took place. That took place was Jesus. What happened in his heart? From anger to love. That's the mark of true salvation. What has God done deep within our hearts?